Uh, so uh, I have a I have a friend who is a pastor. Uh, and last week, because you know it was uh, such a momentous and important Sunday uh, in so many ways, uh, he put this statement out on Facebook as a reminder to some of us who uh, would be preaching that Sunday. He said this. He said, "Preacher, a few things not to say today." Remember, this is last Sunday. Any comparisons of Super Bowl attendance to worship turnout? Puns made of super or bowl? Any reference to Hail Marys or sacrificial rams? <laughs> Jokes about getting out of church early, worship halftime shows, or God, Jesus, us as football positions? And then he says, be better preachers. So in honor of this, um, I thought I would wait until this Sunday to make any football reference or comparison. So uh, I need to tell him that at some point. It's like, really, dude, I waited a week, so I didn't do it on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, but that is also going to be the uh, the last uh, the last hint that you're going to get for the next series of questions I'm going to ask. So, uh, so here those questions go. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be perfect at doing something? <laughs> Why is this the time to look at your husbands and say, don't say it? Or <laughs> husbands do the same thing if necessary. Um, have you ever had a job though, where you were expected to be perfect at it all the time? Did you ever have a job where you knew you could actually be perfect at it every time that you did it? Now, if there were ever such a job in existence, uh, do uh, you would would you ever think that we would probably know what that is, and we probably would know the people that do it because that's got to be like an incredibly special job that people do, right? Sounds like it should be really important. Uh, I mean, at least it sounds like we should, because uh, it's very rare that anyone is perfect at anything. But it's the job that this age they get paid money for. Uh, now, if you watched the Super Bowl last week, you probably saw someone who was perfect at their job through the entirety of the game. Not the refs, because we know they don't always get things right. But there was someone you probably saw. Now the trick to this is, if you watch the Chiefs at all, you also have seen this, uh, seen someone in this position doing this all the time. And football teams uh, will, will, will devote a lot of resources to this person, even. Um, any ideas yet what position I'm talking about? Uh, but here's another hint. Uh, they play about eight plays a game. What's that? The kicker? No? What's that? No? Long snap. Ah, yes. Not coming from where I thought, Scott, I thought you were going to beat me to it this morning, but uh, Josh got it. Uh, the long snapper. They, you know, does anyone know who the long snapper is for the Chiefs? James Winchester. Dude, you are like the only person I know who could have actually answered that question. I'm not surprised, but yeah, that, uh, um, you know, but most of the time you don't know who the long snapper is because, as, as they say, if you know uh, if you know who I am, that means I've done something wrong. Um, but these are guys who typically they uh, they they get uh, they do a great job. We don't know who they are, but they uh, but they do, but they are generally uh, perfect in every play that they that they're in on. Um, and in fact, you know, this uh, uh, they uh, have incredible longevity in their careers. Um, they start out at the league minimum generally, but uh, over the course of time and enough plays, enough uh, time and service, they can be making over a million dollars a year. If you ever wanted to know how you can have the perfect uh, job where you can make a lot of money and not have to work uh, uh, a lot at it, that's the one you need to have. It's not much based in reality because there's not many of us that can do that. I mean, teams will devote a roster spot to having someone on there. Sometimes they'll even devote a draft pick and a high draft pick to get someone to fill that role um, because over time they realize having the backup quarterback uh, act as the long snapper really was not the best thing in the world to do. Um, uh, they flubbed that up a lot back in the day. And uh, I, I know all this not because I'm good at football, but because I listened to a podcast earlier this week that was talking about this. So. Um, I thought, oh, this will kind of work. Uh, but they were they were discussing this, and now it is a very specialized role. There's lots of training for it. There are agents out there that specialize in long snappers. I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently it is. Um, and uh, uh, there are camps for this, and uh, uh, these folks can do a lot. Um, but it's not realistic for the rest of us. Now, there are probably a few other jobs out there where the expectation is that you're, that you're perfect in what you do. But, um, but they all have some things that are in common. And that is they take a lot of resources, they take a lot of time and a lot of practice. Um, and uh, typically there's 
uh, a lot of a lot of pressure that is put on them, and generally we don't know who they are unless they happen to mess up. Um, mostly, it, it means that it is very unlike the reality that any of us are ever going to face. So, we are very rarely ever going to be perfect in anything that we do, because not many of us ever find ourselves in that specific kind of position. So. We need other things. We need forgiveness. We need grace. We need to figure out how do we get through things when, and not if, but when we are perfect at something, when we mess it up. And if we are going to answer this question of why Jesus, why, why do folks need faith in Jesus, why do we need faith in Jesus, then one of the things that we have to be able to do is we have to be able to understand and know and talk about what is forgiveness. What does that really mean? Um, and for that, we turn to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, throughout this series that we've been in, we've, we've been sticking mainly to, uh, to New Testament scripture readings because, uh, because that is, if we're going to talk about Jesus, that's the place where we get the most information about him. But we switched to Jeremiah for this morning because uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 gets quoted directly in Hebrews chapter 8. And then we also get reference to that uh, sprinkled throughout the rest of the Gospels of what forgiveness is. And so we start, we kind of go back, we kind of, so we're going to start at the back part of that scripture reading uh, as far as what Jeremiah says about forgiveness. He says this in verse 34, they will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. The last part of that verse is the most important for us right now. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God is saying, forgiveness is not remembering the people's sins and wrongdoings. That God is not going to remember, uh, remember those things. Which is good. So, then, so what then is it that God, means, uh, that God means by sins or wrongdoings? Remember last week we asked the question, "What is sin?" And we said, coming out of uh, coming out of First John, uh, and I love this passage in there how it describes it. It says, "Sin is rebellion." In other translations, it reads as lawlessness. Both are accurate, but uh, lawlessness, if we if we go that direction, sometimes that can get us into territory where uh, that doesn't actually isn't actually helpful for us. I like the term rebellion there, though. Sin is rebellion. Rebellion against against God, against what God is doing. Sin, rebellion, wrongdoing, all of this, Jeremiah would say, is the broken covenant. The covenant that God has made with us. And it's not just making a mistake, though. Because sometimes that's the, that's the thing we'll say, well, sin is just a mistake. No, sin goes beyond, it's not just a mistake. Sin is is deliberately going against what God has set up by people who should know better. It's not keeping God at the center of our lives. And it is even going beyond that, it, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, causing harm to others in the process of that. And sometimes that can even happen if we, uh, when we don't remember that both of those things are important. It's not just keeping God at the center of our lives, but it is also making sure that uh, that we are not causing harm to others. And we can see this play out there is uh, too many folks think that, um, that keeping God at the center of our lives is the end-all, be-all of our faith. That that is the, th the thing that is by far and away the most important. And then they've taken that, that next step further and they say that by any means necessary, we're going to make sure that people keep God at the center of their lives. Now how that often gets uh, worked out is that it's not by any means necessary, but most of what folks mean is by the only means that I know how I came to know who Jesus is, I'm going to make sure everyone else has that exact same experience. And then if we're not careful, that turns into fear and that turns into shame. And it means that there are some folks that are really good at trying to make folks afraid of God's wrath. And others that will shame folks for uh, not holding to a very specific set of values. And this cuts across all the spectrums from left to right, the center, and everything in between. Uh, we can find uh, these experiences where, in the attempt to keep God at the center of things, we forget that also our job is to not cause harm. Or even better, to help bring harm to an end. 
All of those things are part of that rebellion because it goes against the covenant that God made with his people. The covenant where we keep God at the center of our faith and our lives and that we seek to build out a healthy community together that is shaped by God. All of those other things continue harm and it in fact causes even more harm because they are continuing to break that covenant. But God knows all of this, knows that this is how things are going to go and how things are going to work. And he reminds us of this in, uh, in just the very first part of this passage, verse 31. The time is to come, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. Now there's two ways we can read this. One way is to read this as a threat. Where God is saying, y'all done screwed up, but we're going to make sure we're going to, by God, we're going to come and I'm going to come and I'm going to fix this. You better get things straight because here I come. But we remember what God is doing. God is making a new covenant. And this isn't, this isn't based in fear. This isn't based in anger. This is based in hope and what God has been doing all throughout Scripture. In fact, we go to the next verse. He says, it won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke the covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. He said, they should know better. They knew who I was. I brought them out of the land, yet they still broke that covenant. And this passage gets repeated again in the book of Hebrews, and it gets referenced in so many other places because we continue to break that covenant, and we have to remember what God is saying. It has been saying throughout all the scriptures, God is saying, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you yet. There's still more to this. Forgiveness is God saying, I'm not done with you. Even though you've broken the thing that we made together, I'm going to make a new one because I knew that was kind of going to happen. I knew you were going to struggle with it. And this new one, it's not going to be like the old one because you aren't the same people that you were. But I'm not done with you yet. So we're going to do, we're going to do it again. We're going to try it again, and we're going to do it over and over and over and over, as many times as it takes, because this is what God has been doing from the very beginning. Remember, God knew that we were going to fail, that we were going to sin, that we were going to rebel. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had one job, one job only, don't eat the fruit. So, of course, what is the very first thing that they do? Eat the fruit, right? God knew that was going to happen. So he says, all right, y'all did the thing I told you not to do. Okay, we're going to do something different now. You can't stay here because you're different now than you were. We're going to go out here. We're going to go outside of the garden. We're going to make this work again. We're going to do it over again. And God has been with them through all of that time. He didn't leave them alone. And it isn't in them. Forgiveness is creating a new covenant in Jeremiah's time that yes, the people of Israel weren't going to be the same after that. They weren't going to go back to the great kingdoms of old and the great kings and leaders and prophets and all of that. They were going to be different, but God wasn't done with them yet. Forgiveness is God's saying they can still be my people. Forgiveness is God saying that you are still struggling with this, so, uh, so I'm going to send my son to come into the world to show you another way of this. Forgiveness is God saying that when my son comes back up and ascends back into heaven, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be in a constant presence with you so that you know I am there. So you know I'm not done with you. Forgiveness is God constantly saying, I'm not done with you, even if we think that he is or that he should be. But we can still figure this out. So let's put all this together. Last week we said out of 1 John that, um, that we're given a choice to either practice righteousness, knowing that we are still going to sin sometimes, or to practice sin, knowing that occasionally we may actually do a good thing. And that's the choice that is ours to make. As people of faith, we choose to practice righteousness, knowing that we're still going to sin sometimes. That's a part of what that means. So the question is, how do we get through that sin? We get through it with forgiveness. Knowing that we have been forgiven, knowing that God is saying to each and every one of us that I am not done with you yet. And God understands that when we sin the first time, that he is already at work to help us know that we've been forgiven because sin is something we can do on its own, but it's also cumulative. 
first one can lead to a second one or third one or fourth one, and that can build up over time and it can become overwhelming. So God is always at work to cancel the power of sin. Because he wants us to be his people, to know that righteousness, to know what that means. And so to make this work, we receive God's forgiveness. And in, as to, in, and in his turn, we practice righteousness ourselves. We offer forgiveness to others because God has made this new covenant with us. Now next week, we're going to come back to the main question of this whole series. Why Jesus? Why should we have faith in Jesus? All of the questions that uh, we've been answering kind of up to this point will come back to help us answer that question. And it will set up for us what's kind of what we're going to be, where we're going to, excuse me, it will set up for us where we're going to be spending our time during the season of Lent, going deeper into what does practicing righteousness mean? What does this new covenant mean for us? This covenant that God is making with us. But for now, this week, let's go out and practice righteousness. Go out and practice being God's people, receiving his forgiveness, offering it in turn, knowing that there isn't anyone that's going to get it right all the time because uh, no one is, uh, is going to be perfect all the time except for Winchester. Winchester, I can't remember his first name now. Uh, James. <laughs> James Winchester. Uh, you know, well, we hope that he's perfect. We'll see next season what that brings. But we aren't going to get that right all the time. But God says, I'm with you. And I'm not done with you. And so let us go and be a people that practice that righteousness and live out that life that he has called us to. It's not easy, but it is better than any other that we could live. And so let's go and live that life and do all this in Christ's name. Amen.